uh, on Law Seeko. And uh, we are here with uh, Mr. Jay Harrington, and we are here to have a very uh, interesting discussion with him on uh, uh, how 2021 is going to be the year uh, of the entrepreneurial lawyer. And uh, just to introduce uh, our guest today, uh, Jay is a lawyer and he's the president at uh, J uh, Harrington Communications. And he's a lawyer and a business coach. And uh, what he specializes is in is helping lawyers in building profitable legal practices. So Jay, uh, Law Seco has a very vast Indian and international audience and we cater to independent practitioners uh, who want to expand their practice and build new clients. So we've invited you here so that you know we understand from your experience and we can also reach out to the audience and provide them some practical tips or that lawyers can you know take away from themselves from uh, this conversation. So I think I'm going to start with the first question uh, uh, for you, and which is uh, coming to the topic, uh, the year of the entrepreneurial lawyer, right? And uh, I just, uh, in one of your recent posts, uh, I think uh, we are bringing in the topic from there, where you talked about how, you know, you discovered law as an entrepreneurial journey. And uh, I think I'll draw my first question from there that, uh, you know, why uh, do you think, uh, why, why, why do you call this year to be the year of entrepreneurial lawyer? And why is it important for lawyers to embrace the entrepreneur within? Uh, yeah, that's a great place to start. And thank you for having me. I, I'm excited to be here. Um, so I, I think that, you know, for a long time, uh, the legal, legal industry, those who work in it, uh, it's been considered more of a profession than an entrepreneurial endeavor. Mm -hmm. And that made sense for a long time. I mean, I, you know, I practiced in the United States and for a long time, you know, working at law firms, there were more institutional clients, you know, the ones that would sort of stick with the firm year over year. And, okay. and younger lawyers, they were told things like, just kind of keep your head down and do good work. You don't have to necessarily, um, you know, go out and think about building a practice. All you really need to do is, is do good work and the future will take care of itself. And I think that's really changed. I mean, across the economy, there's been obviously great disruption and great dispersion uh, where people have to take more direct control over their careers and, and you know, really take ownership of their future to a gr greater extent. And that's, no, that's certainly the case in the legal industry. So um, the, the good news is I think with all of the disruption from COVID and just the general shifts in the economy towards a more digital one, um, remote working being much more common, I think around the world, there are more entrepreneurial opportunities for lawyers to be taking advantage of things like really thinking about building your personal brand on LinkedIn and other platforms through connection and, and content creation, um, thinking about, you know, how do you build a practice as a lawyer mm -hmm. um, such that you have, I, I oftentimes hit upon this concept of autonomy, the idea that one of the best ways I think to get satisfaction out of one's career is to be more autonomous, meaning more independent, more in control, and more, uh, more apt to be able to shape your future circumstances. And I think for lawyers, the best way to do that is not to necessarily just count on your colleagues to feed you work, but rather to have clients of your own. And as a result, that requires you to think more like an entrepreneur as opposed to just someone who's an employee in a business. Um, and then the flip side of that, or, or, or in addition to that, why I think entrepreneurship is so, so top of mind for lawyers right now is that, uh, you know, I think that more and more lawyers are looking for opportunities to expand what they're doing and generate income and generate satisfaction outside of just the practice of law. So I know that um, I'm observing more lawyers starting to become coaches. You know, we talk, we, we mm. oftentimes call these things side hustles, mm. right? Where you're, you have mm. a full-time okay. career, but you're starting to pursue something new on the side. So that might be, you know, writing books, starting a podcast, becoming a coach, doing okay. some consulting work, um, starting some business in another domain, uh, maybe creating an online course, whatever the case mm. might be. I think there are mm. opportunities for lawyers to take their expertise and translate those into, you know, some other product or service. And, and I think because we're in an era where there are far fewer gatekeepers to those opportunities, you know, you don't need to wait on a publisher to publish a book. You can just self-publish on Amazon or, you know, podcasting is much easier to do than ever before. Um, you can start a blog and, and start generating, um, you know, 
uh, at least an audience such that you can turn that audience into, into some new business. So the opportunities are there. It's just, it's the moment, I think. I think there's a, a desire to pursue different interests that may be outside of um, just the practice of law. And, and we're in a moment where that's possible. So I think that's kind of why I was thinking about this year being entrepreneurial, um, especially in the legal profession. No, absolutely. I think, uh, uh, you know, I'll agree with you. And, and it's so interesting to see that, you know, how the problems that junior lawyers face is the same across the legal profession, uh, be it US or be it India. Like even here, like, you know, when you're an associate at a law firm, uh, uh, it's not uh, looked upon uh, for you to generate clients or to have more autonomy, but it's more like, you know, you need to, like you said, put your head down and do hard work and uh, hope that the journey is going to take you somewhere. But, uh, you know, I'm going to take up uh, uh, the, pra- the, the, uh, the point of building a practice for an independent lawyer separately. But I think I would like to touch upon the fact that how do you build autonomy while you're working as uh, in a firm? Like, you know, a lot of, a lot of our audience are uh, lawyers who are working in firms. They are two to three years or four, up to five years of experience in a firm. And you know they get caught up within that within that domain, right? You don't mm-hmm. want uh, you're not you don't understand that you can step out and also pursue the other interests that you were speaking about. So that autonomy uh, creation becomes a little difficult. So uh, for such kind of audience, what would your uh, uh, like some tips on uh, how do you build autonomy while working in a law firm so that you can look at uh, the future in a different way in a more substantive manner? Yeah, it's a great question. And I mean, we all, I think it's, it's unrealistic to think that a lawyer maybe in their second or third year of experience is going to be particularly equipped to go out and start generating, you know, new business, generating clients for themselves. Um, but I think that what they need to be thinking about is um, what the future holds for them, right? It, it's, I, I'm not unrealistic in the sense that, you know, I was a young lawyer in a big law firm and it's a hard grind. It's not yeah. easy. Um, but the, the, key, the key thing is recognizing that the, the future can be brighter and more autonomous for yourself, but it really depends on the work that you put in at the point where you're you know, a, a young lawyer to set the stage or lay a foundation for autonomy in the future. So we, we talk about entrepreneurship and we think, okay, that, that usually means you know, you're, you're going out, you're taking risks um, in the context of being a lawyer, you're going out and trying to develop new business, but what's a young lawyer to do who's only has two years of experience where the firm may not allow them to engage in that type of behavior, yeah. meaning they, they're not interested in them bringing in clients yeah. because they're not enough of an expert to be able to yeah. be able to do that. Um, but what I, what I think that is important, one way to think about it and, and, and prepare yourself for the entrepreneurial journey ahead is, is thinking like, a, like an intrapreneur within your firm. Yeah. So we have entrepreneurship term, yeah. outside of the firm, intrapreneurship within the firm. So starting to act as an entrepreneur within the confines of your law firm. So making sure that you're, you're networking with your colleagues you're trying to look for opportunities to serve in leadership positions within your firm, even if it's associated with committees that you know are not obviously the management committee, but many times there are other committees within the firm you can serve on and, and start to develop those leadership skills. Um, thinking, trying to establish yourself as a thought leader within the firm, meaning you know, if you're in a particular practice group or you work, your firm works on a particular set of issues, thinking about the interesting topics that you're dealing with, you know, some of the research issues or some of the, you know, whatever you do litigation work or transactional work, what are the interesting issues that you can, you could present to the uh, colleagues in the firm. Mm. So you get an opportunity to um, exercise and practice some of those thought leadership skills that you'll need later on when you're speaking to external audiences. So I, I always advise um, young lawyers to really try to think, you know, Think like an entrepreneur in the sense that you want to be building your network outside of the firm. You want to start creating content that maybe you're publishing on LinkedIn and elsewhere. But you also want to think like an entrepreneur where you're, you're really exercising those skills in, a, in an environment in which it's possible to do some of these things in a, in a relatively low risk way. Um, and you're, you're, you're essentially building that muscle of entrepreneurship that you can then exercise to a greater degree when you're, you know, maybe a fourth or fifth year lawyer who's ready to go out and start trying to build a book of business. No, that's, I think uh, entrepreneur is a great term 
for uh, young lawyers uh, who think that you know they're limited within a box and uh, you know they're not able to step out or, or they think that it's only when i go into an independent practice is when i'm going to uh, you know exercise my autonomy so uh, that is complete that's that's uh, very true and i think uh, uh, you know uh, you use this term thought leader and i think i'm going to build up from here and uh, i also see that uh, you know um, i follow you on linkedin and i see a lot of your posts are driven towards uh, helping lawyers understand how to become thought leaders so uh, could you could you help us understand what do you mean a by thought leader and uh, be it an independent lawyer or a lawyer who has just started a firm or somebody who's working in a firm i think that term encompasses everyone so um how how do you how do you how do you convince people how do you tell people to become thought leaders is uh, where is my question here Sure, sure. So yeah, so just to maybe put a definition on the term, because um, I think there's always some confusion around it. The, the idea of becoming a thought leader is one where you are starting to be seen as a, a, a visible expert among an audience that you're trying to reach through the content you create. And the content you create might be written content, it might be video content, audio content through a podcast or public speaking. It's, it's sort of domain agnostic. Uh, but what you're doing is not just a, a lot of lawyers and other people create content, but what you're trying to do to become perceived as a thought leader. And, and just one, one important point here is, I, I think it's, I don't think thought leader is a title we give ourselves. It's something we earn and other people start calling us that, mm -hmm. right? True. So you, it takes, it, which, which points to the fact that it takes time. This is not something that happens overnight. Mm -hmm. This is not the type of, of, marketing strategy that you know you can you can go out and you know it's like it's not like running google ads or something right it doesn't happen overnight it doesn't happen quickly you have to put in work but that's the value in it because many people aren't willing to put in that work to create valuable ideas and share them with the world and and so as a result those who are you know can really benefit from that so it's really this distinction between you know when it comes down to marketing there's there's two ways to go at it you can either buy attention, so that would be the advertising model, or you can earn it, and that would be more the thought leadership model, where mm. you're you're sharing mm. your ideas and gaining visibility and trust with your audience by being helpful, um, helping them to gain new insight, uh, bringing valuable ideas to the table that help your audience, meaning your prospective clients, um, do their jobs better, um, run their businesses more effectively. So, so that's kind of the idea. That's maybe the, the definition we talk about. And, it, and then it comes down to a few things um, when you think about, okay, how do I, how do I think about you know, aspiring to become someone who other people perceive as a thought leader? And it, yeah. really, comes, yeah. it, really, it really comes down to first starting with a, a question to ask yourself, which is who is the audience I'm trying to attract? So, in, so in, I'll just use my experience um, in my consulting work as an example to maybe make this more relevant. Um, our business is focused on lawyers and law firms exclusively. A lot of the ideas that I'm writing about, speaking about are generally centered on marketing and business development. The, the, the tactics and the ideas I share are relevant to, potentially relevant to a much broader audience. So a consultant, an accountant, you know, other people in professional services, the, the ideas, the core ideas are all transferable to those domains, but I focus all of my content and the language I'm using and the emphasis I'm making and the stories I'm telling on the legal community specifically, because the narrower you focus your audience and as a result, your content, the more it will resonate with a particular audience. So that's really why you have to, you have to start by saying, okay, I am going to define my, in this case, maybe ideal client audience. Who am I really trying to attract through my content? Because if I'm just trying to appeal to everyone, it's likely that the content I'm creating will, won't be all that resonant or, or perceived as valuable to any particular audience because it'll be too general, it'll be too watered down, it'll be too generic. Um, whereas when you speak to one single audience, you can really contextualize that content and those ideas for that specific group of people that you're trying to reach. And it doesn't need to be, you know, the, 
the mistake I think that's made is, you know, if I, if I can reach more people, if I can make my ideas more broadly relevant, then the more opportunities will come my way. But that's, um, that's not the way it happens. It's when, okay. uh, again, this particular group of people, this minimum viable audience that you're attracting really resonates with your, with your content. They start to see you um, as someone worth paying attention to. And as a result, they start to develop trust in your ability to deliver your expertise that they start to perceive you as a thought leader. And then if you're the one who's bringing new and interesting ideas to them on a consistent basis, well, then you're the one who's going to be first in line when they're thinking of who to hire to help them handle those types of issues from a, you know, a, a, a legal services standpoint. Um, so it's really about starting with, okay, who is my audience? And then once you, once you understand that, um, then the, the task of creating content to serve that audience becomes a lot easier. Um, if, you, if, you're, if your thought leadership or content strategy aligns with the goals for your practice, meaning you're writing or creating audio or video content for the audience that you hope to serve as a lawyer, well then, and, you, and that you do serve as a lawyer, well then you'll have lots of great ideas for content because you'll be drawing upon the work you're doing for those types of clients to understand mm -hmm. what questions yeah. are they asking? What problems right. are they dealing with? What opportunities are facing them? And then you can just build, build a, your content based on your real world experience interacting with these people. Um, so there's that alignment between the two things. And then lastly, you know, it's all about understanding, well, how do I, how do I, okay, so I've identified my audience. I've identified yeah. the key questions that I need to, to be focused on in order to create content. And I'm actually starting to create content. Well, how do I make sure that content is reaching the right people? So this is when it comes down to, you know, oftentimes an overlooked key step when you're on your on the road to becoming a thought leader is publishing and promotion strategy as it relates to your content. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, like, again, I'll go back to my own example um, because it's obviously one I know well and I can speak to, but for my audience of lawyers and law firms, um, I know they're all on LinkedIn, right? So yeah. I don't, I don't try, worry about any other social media platform. I don't, yeah. I, I, I guess I'm technically on Twitter, but I don't spend any, I don't really spend right. any time there. Uh, Facebook, Instagram, all that. It's all LinkedIn because I know that's where my audience is spending its time and attention mm -hmm. and looking mm -hmm. for information of the, of the variety that I provide. Mm -hmm. So that's where I, that's the, that's where I'm devoting all of my attention and I'm publishing all of my content. I'm creating content directly on LinkedIn as posts. And I, and I have a blog and I publish with other publications that cater to the legal industry and I'll promote that content on LinkedIn. But it's all, it's all understanding what is the ecosystem in which the people you're trying to reach are spending their time and attention. So that, you know, that, that's the key thing is to understand where, again, where, where are your people looking for information such that you can start showing up there through your content and you'll become top of mind and build trust as a result of that. Got it. So um, uh, I'll just uh, also tell the audience here that, uh, you know, please uh, feel free to put your questions in the chat section and we're going to take a look at it uh, during the discussion and uh, maybe pose the discussion, but I'm going to pick up all the questions uh, in, the, uh, in this uh, session itself. And I think, uh, you know, I'll draw my next question uh, so uh, there is a question here. Okay, so this is uh, uh, by this person Arun Meena, and he asks, "What should be the strategy for a fresher who wants to start his own law firm?" Now I will expand on this question a bit, uh, just to also add, you know, my own experience, and uh, I wanted your opinion on this. So you know, I'm an independent legal counsel. I have worked in firms and in-house uh, roles. And I started working independently last year. So one of the problems that I also faced in terms of, you know, putting out content was the fact that um, I was doing multiple things. I'm still doing multiple things for clients, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I also want to put out multiple, uh, uh, you know, uh, opinions or, uh, uh, or information regarding to the multiple fields that I'm working on. And uh, uh, how, so, you know, I always wonder, if that's going to dilute, uh, uh, you know, the fact that uh, people are going to perceive me in a specific uh, manner, or am I going to come out as a generalist? 
so uh, you know i think i'll draw from arun's question that you know when you are starting a practice and when you are new to this then how do you navigate this that you know how do you want to how, how what's the right i wouldn't say what's the right way but what's the right approach to start becoming a thought leader when you know you are you want to take up every kind of work also yeah. and you have two to three interests and uh, you're not sure if i should put uh, posts and create content regarding those two to three uh, uh, domains or should i stick to one and keep doing the work for another i hope i am not yeah. uh, convoluting yeah. the question too much here. no no I, i i understand exactly what you're talking about cuz i i was um in a similar position when i when hmm. uh i i was at a very large international law firm i went to another one and then i went off on my own and i started my own law firm and it was a much different task i mean again when i was at the large firms i didn't have to think about business development or marketing because the work was mm-hmm. there and then all of a sudden i you know we we call it hanging a shingle right and i was all of a sudden in a position where i had to go out and and get all of the work myself um now what my approach was and i think the the what my recommendation is to to address your your question specifically is um i think that it's okay to be creating content in multiple domains like if you have okay. a multifaceted practice but i would say this i think that ultimately if you're really hoping to make content marketing or thought leadership marketing a key part of your marketing strategy i would be doing that with an eye towards narrowing my focus over time okay. like if you're going to be creating you know content across various practice groups use it more as a, as an experiment Uh, as, as an experiment in order to think about narrowing down your focus because again i, I just think from a practical standpoint um you know this has got to be just part of your you know day obviously yeah. you can't devote a tremendous amount of time to content creation yeah. and if you're spreading yourself too thin it's just going to be really hard to gain uh traction with any particular audience if you're if you're spreading yourself too thin in that regard so you don't need to pick immediately but i would say that as your maybe practice strategy shifts your content strategy should be as well my my experience has been working with clients is that sometimes many times lawyers have a tendency um you know towards risk aversion where they want to keep their options open they want to you know have multiple doors that they can walk through and that generally translates into you know maybe a more general practice and there's nothing wrong with that necessarily but when it comes to marketing where you're only spending you only have so much time to spend on marketing and business development mm. Mm. if you disperse yourself and your ideas too broadly yeah. again you're just going to have a hard time because because what you're really trying to do is again there are probably you know there's only a certain handful of people who are really digging into this type of strategy and being seen as true thought leaders who are starting to generate inbound opportunities for work as a result yeah. of the ideas you're sharing yeah. um lots of people create content but they generally aren't seeing much benefit from it and it's probably because they're too inconsistent or they're too mm. buried in their approach so they're never getting to the point where yeah. they gain traction and and i also I'll also caution or or I guess advise clients to say look when it comes to your marketing especially if you're having a more narrow focus which I think mm. is the key to actually making your marketing more effective it's about your marketing is about what the work the type of work you pursue not necessarily the work you do so meaning you don't need to stop doing you know if you have multiple practices that you that you handle you don't need to stop doing that work you can generate work in those other practices from in through business development networking referrals from other attorneys that type of work comes in but if you want your marketing to be effective mm-hmm. i do think it's important to narrow your focus and and really try to focus on maybe what what is the what is the best market opportunity for me where do i see my practice in 5 years do i still want to be doing you know these four or five things because that's the type of work that's coming in the door right now and that's what i need to do in order to sustain myself economically or do i want a different type of practice 5 years from now which is something mm-hmm. that's more focused where i'm handling the similar type of work for similar types of clients I'm doing, you know, higher margin, more high, highly more highly profitable work. Mm-hmm. I'm seen as a real expert in my domain and and I'm able to because I'm only focused on, you know, a narrower set of issues, I'm really building my expertise at a level that's faster mm-hmm. and um then, you know, faster and and more effective than I could as mm-hmm. when I was spreading myself too thin. Mm-hmm. So I think 
I, I hope that answers your question. I don't think it it's does, an it or necessarily, but I yeah. do think that I do think that you should be thinking for if, if the goal is to be generating work and opportunities for yourself through the content you're creating and ultimately becoming seen as a thought leader. Narrow focus is important because you can go much deeper on issues, yeah. the l fewer sets of issues you're focused on and you're going to just gain expertise more quickly, if that makes sense. No, absolutely. I think uh, uh, I agree with you on, on here. And I think, uh, uh, I guess what's, what you said, you know, the key is uh, basically consistency. I think, uh, you know, it's uh, like you said, uh, even if multiple domains is okay, but it's only for experiment stage and you need to see which of what audience is clicking with which post mm -hmm. and what, what people are liking. Uh, I think consistency, but then becomes the most important thing. Like, you know, how consistent are you in putting up the posts? Yeah. Uh, are you tracking that? Are you also commenting on other people's posts who, have, who are also putting out uh, posts in the same area that you're putting? Uh, so uh, when I see consistency, now the question is because we have, because a lot, large part of our audience is also law students, you know, like, uh, and a lot of them uh, would I have maybe <clears throat> have either graduated in 2020 or are graduating in 2021. And uh, I think the scene right now is that, you know, everybody is facing some difficulty in finding uh, employment due to, you know, uh, the disruption that was caused by COVID. But otherwise also, uh, would you suggest, or would you suggest in terms of building consistency, uh, do, should law students uh, start at an early age or like as in like when they are when they get, get into law school should they start at that point of time should they start mm -hmm. putting out posts and what kind of uh, uh, you know content creation uh, would be helpful for them what kind of content creation sure. will be something that they can uh, maybe use tomorrow to get entry into a law firm because that's mm -hmm. what most of the law students at that point of time are looking at yeah, no, great question. Um, and so the answer to all of that, I think it, it, you know, there's multiple parts of that, but I think it's yes to all, meaning um, law students or, or lawyers in the first year of experience, maybe even those who are still searching for yeah. their first job, um, they should absolutely be thinking about content creation because uh, it's, it's the way to be visible to the audience mm -hmm. that you're trying to um, attract uh, in a way that's not, you know, seen as overtly pushy or, or having a sales pitch associated with it. It's a way to be, again, be visible in a way that builds trust, not, not sort of pushes people away from you. Um, so here, here's the, um, so a couple things, like let's talk about LinkedIn specifically, because yeah. I think that's, yeah. you know, the domain where this is most relevant. Um, yeah. If I was someone in law school right now, I'd be doing two things. I would be, um, commenting on and reacting to the posts that are being mm. shared by lawyers and, um, mm. and, and law firm leaders who you want to be in, the, you know, you want to be in their network. Um, anyone who's creating content on LinkedIn notices the people who are reacting to that content. So there's a lot yeah. of people on the LinkedIn platform who are, you know, I think, they're oftentimes called lurkers, meaning people that are on there, they're, they're, mm. they're viewing what's happening, they're reading, but they're not actually taking any, any action on the mm. platform. Um, so if you want to connect with someone who is running a law firm that you want, or, or part of the hiring committee for a law firm that you potentially want a job at, and the first step forward to be able to get that job is to make some connection with that person, there's no better way to do it than putting thoughtful comments into the comment threads in their, uh, mm. in response to their posts. Because again, if you're, you know, once you get to the point where you're creating your own content, you'll, you'll realize that it takes effort um, and you yeah. want people to take notice of what you're doing, right? Uh, yeah. It feels good when yeah. someone comments on your post and not just, mm -hmm. not just the, you know, it, it's fine to write something like that was a great post or, you know, really mm. interesting, but take the time to actually, write that, write a thoughtful question in response to that post or add some additional insight on top of it. And that person will take notice. And the, I, I want this, this is related to a common mistake that you see on LinkedIn. I think that many people make, which is they'll see someone they want to connect with and they'll simply cl mm. click connect with that person. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That person yeah. doesn't know who you are. They don't know what your motivation is. Um, oftentimes that connection will, that connection request will be denied or ignored. 
But if you spend two weeks, uh, you show up three to four times in the comments to their posts, there's a high likelihood that they'll accept your connection request. And there's also a high mm. likelihood that they'll send you a connection request. Mm. Um, because mm. again, anyone who's creating content on LinkedIn appreciates people you know, reacting and, and, and providing thoughtful comments yeah. to that. So that's, that's number one. Um, you wanna build your network. You wanna connect with people who are sort of above you in the hierarchy mm. right now, meaning they're decision makers who could have a positive impact in your career. Comment on their posts, react to their posts, be visible to them, be thoughtful in what you're doing. Um, then, you know, once you're once you're doing that um, and you've started kind of building your network on LinkedIn, I absolutely think that um, you know law students, young lawyers should be creating their own content. And and what what type of content is that? Well, there, there's a few different ways to think about it. Um, one one way that I recommend is to say, especially as a way to ease into this, is to not trying, you're, you're not in a position because you're not yet an expert in legal issues, mm. right? You're just yeah, not there yeah. yet. But you know what you are an expert in? Your lived experience, like your, your experience as a person who's going through a difficult challenge like law mm. school, for example. So I always, I always think that, um, I, and I know lawyers who do this, who are now like first year lawyers and have huge followings on LinkedIn, because they essentially we're using LinkedIn as a blog to journal about their law school mm. experience. Yeah. And as a result of doing that, people will take notice who are again, up the hierarchy from you because you're sort of joining the conversation within the legal industry. You're, but you'll also be building your network among your, um, among your colleagues or, or contemporaries in law school. And those who are following behind you, maybe someone who's in undergraduate college right now and looking to go yeah. to law school, they're going to be interested in what you have to say. So again, if you're if what you're trying to do is play the long game here with your thought leadership content, um, starting where you are, you know, and building upon that, not waiting until you feel like you know you've you've removed all the imposter syndrome and you feel like you're a, a real expert and now you're going to burst on the scene and start creating content. Mm. No, mm. write about what you know, write about your lived experience, which at this mm. point in time might be. How am I getting through law school? What would other, what would, yeah. I might be, a, you know, I might be a second year law student. What would a first year law student gain from my experience? Um, that's, that's always to me a great starting point for thinking about creating content um, because what you're going to be doing, you're going to be creating content in the comments to other people's posts. Yeah. That's thought leadership. That's, that's content creation. And then you start creating content of your own in your posts through, you know, your life experience. And that might be law school mm. right now, or it might be your approach to trying to, a great way I think for a, a lawyer who right now is a graduate from law school and is looking for their first job is to be writing about that experience of trying to find your first mm. job, right? You're gonna take, you're gonna, you know, what, what are you doing? What successes or failures have you had? Um, how are you going about it? Uh, asking questions of other people. You know, you wanna get noticed by hiring committee people, like people who are in charge of hiring at a law firm ask thoughtful questions about, you know, what is the best way to go about this process? Or here's what I've experienced. What do you think about this approach? And yeah. you're going to, you're going to start creating conversation around that very topic that you're trying to be, you know, noticed, noticed for meaning your job search and, and the right people will, will take notice of that. So again, it doesn't need to be complicated. It doesn't need to be about subject matter expertise of on, on a legal issue. It can be just about your your experience and where you're at in your career at any given moment in time. Yeah. No, that's that's very true. I think that that's a very that's a great point about uh, you know writing about their lived experience because um, at the time when you are in law school, uh, you've not become an expert in anything. You're studying so many different things, and it's very difficult to even think that you know this is the topic that I like mm -hmm. or this is something that I'm interested in. Uh, I mean, you know, so specifically that I'm going to create content around it, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, experience such as, you know, even internship, like people do different kinds of internships, mm -hmm. you come across so many different uh, questions of law, uh, yeah. policy that you're coming across. I think for students, you know, writing that also will, will mm -hmm. be something that they can be consistent about and they can create, you know, general content about that. So, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I think... Uh, you know, I'm going to come back uh, to something very specific and uh, that you had touched upon earlier. And uh, what I wanted to know from you is that, you know, uh, you spent, you, uh, like you said, that, you know, your audience is 
based out and it's very important to understand where your audience is right so for, for example for you the audience is linkedin and uh, you engage very effectively with your audience there so um let's assume like you know let's let's think for from the perspective of a lawyer who has uh, who who wants to you know build a practice via content creation and i'm pointing this out because you know uh, uh i don't know if you're aware of this but in india lawyers can't advertise themselves uh that's prohibited under the bar council rules so uh for indian lawyers specifically one thing that has come up very greatly like you know over the last uh, few years is content creation over linkedin like i personally see a lot of my colleagues friends uh law firms uh being extremely active so now of course law firms have uh you know these um, law firms have strategists who are working uh for them in that uh, uh in that domain but as a lawyer uh you know when i'm creating post on linkedin or when i want to create content on linkedin uh uh maybe i think some maybe top 3 tips for example that you would give to lawyers who who are starting to create content on linkedin that how do you go about that like you know uh how like is post yeah. a good way do you publish uh, stories like you know mm -hmm. certain certain ways of how to start yeah. this process yeah for sure so yeah um i think that a first fundamental tip would be um focus on posts right um so i don't i don't think that the linkedin um publishing you know the longer form article mm -hmm. uh option they have it does doesn't get any views no distribution for whatever reason linkedin doesn't really give much attention to that so what gets the most attention is the the simple text post now video is good too i think mm. um if you want to do okay. video but but if you're if we're talking about writing um the mm. the written text post and the mistake that many lawyers make um is thinking about linkedin as a link sharing platform right where mm. you're writing something on your law firm blog or website and then you're sharing a link to that content and so you're essentially using linkedin as a promotional tool right you're trying to drive people okay. back to your okay. website linkedin like any social media platform suppresses that content because they don't want people to leave linkedin um they want people to stay on linkedin so the opportunity okay. the opportunity is to create content that lives natively on the platform through hmm. the simple old fashioned text post you know the 1300 okay. character limit text post yeah. i don't i don't i don't use graphics or images associated with my post i don't include hmm. links i shouldn't say i never do occasionally i do but i do every day every morning i post a, a just a text post um it's like a mini blog post uh you hmm. know usually about around 200 words and then maybe if i do a second post on a day it might be a link to a podcast episode i recorded or something i wrote for another website or something like that but the key thing is focus on the uh form of content creation that linkedin favors that linkedin okay. will give distribution to and that's text posts because again they want you to stay on the platform um and then when you're thinking about you know the mechanics of a text post um think you've got to think about it uh differently than you might you know your your a blog post you're writing on um your okay. website there there are there are parallels but there are some key differences so um you know you think about your average user on linkedin they're probably on their phone using the app um they're scrolling right uh you need to think about your first line of your post mm. as essentially the headline that you would attach to a blog or an article right you need to grab their attention um and and so that's key to be thinking about now what's often overlooked as well is that that's not the only line of a post you're writing on linkedin that's important um if you if you're doing just a a, a no image no graphic text post well then line 5 of your post is extremely important as well because okay. if you if you think about it line 5 is the one that corresponds to that little see more button um that you'll see in the post so that is true so, If you want to if you want people to see more, well you better intrigue mm. them as to why that's the case. So line 5 is often a place to kind of leave a little cliffhanger in yeah. your post. You know, like you might your first line might say something like, you know, I, well, not, I'm not going to use the exact language, but like you're identifying a problem, you know, okay. you space you uh, you know, here's why it matters and then the fifth line is and here's mm. what you need to do about it with a colon mm. and then you know mm. naturally people if they want to know what to do about it they're going to have to click okay. see more um and then finally 
think also about your last line because what you're trying to do on LinkedIn is not just, you know, not just give a speech, so to speak. You're starting to, you want to start catalyzing a conversation, right? You want people to engage with your content in the comments. That's how, you know, that's the beauty of LinkedIn to me from a content creation standpoint is when you're writing for your, you know, a blog post for your website, it's, it's very asynchronous, meaning there's no, it's, you know, someone might find that post and interact with it, but there's no way for them to interact with you back unless they take the time to email or call you, which almost never yeah. happens, right? Yeah. Um, whereas on LinkedIn, it's still asynchronous in the sense that you're not having a direct chat with someone necessarily. You're, po you're posting content, other people are engaging with it, but they, they can leave comments right there. It's a very intimate experience in the sense that it's your picture, it's your name, it's your headline, it's your content, and then they can mm. engage with that. So you're ha you are really starting to have a conversation mm. with people as a result. Mm. But in order to provoke that conversation, that last line, maybe it's a question, maybe it's something just, you know, a provocative statement in yeah. order to try to get that conversation started. And that conversation is then what oftentimes leads to, you know, more, uh, a more personal relationship with the people you're connected to on LinkedIn and potentially new business opportunities. Um, so thinking about not just, the, um, you know, the substance of our posts, that's obviously important, but also there's some of these form issues that, that we need to be thinking about too, to make sure that our content is, you know, you don't want long blocks of text. It's yeah. very difficult to read on LinkedIn. You know, you want to utilize things like bullet points. Um, the form issues do matter because it can stop someone from scrolling and that's what you're trying to do. And then it, then your okay. substance has to take okay. over, right? Okay. You still have to have something really relevant to say as a result of that. Um, so that, I think that's another, uh, another key tip. I'm trying to think of one more uh, good one here that I can share. Um, I guess the, the last one is understand the opportunity. Um, one of the things I think that stops people from creating content on LinkedIn, uh, there's a few reasons, but one of them is they don't necessarily understand the opportunity. Um, hmm. And the opportunity is great. Uh, you know, we, we oftentimes think of um, social media networks as just these vast, you know, wastelands of, you know, <laughs> yeah. Twitter, I, where I, it's, I it's like, yeah. you're just going to be, you're going to be a needle in a haystack at best, right? right? Okay. Where LinkedIn is different, um, you know, there's approaching 750 million users on the platform, but LinkedIn tells us through its data that less than 1% of the people on the platform are actually actively creating content, meaning, and they define wow, that that's as, a great statistic, yeah. yeah, they, they define that as like one post per week. Um, and, and that's hardly anything. So, so as a result, it's a content deficient platform, meaning there's way more people looking for content on the platform than there are people creating content on the platform. So to the extent that you're willing to step into that opportunity and start to become a content creator and thought leader, there's plenty of room for your voice to be heard. Um, so don't, you know, don't be afraid. Don't think that you're just going to be invisible. Um, mm -hmm. You can, you know, I, I know I know lawyers who I've worked with, who I've coached, who I collaborate with, who have generated significant practices um, hmm. just with the only marketing tactic that they employ being writing content on LinkedIn. Because again, Order. you know, if I'm, if I'm focused on content creation and I'm just focused on putting content on my blog, you know, that could be effective that, you know, you're more visible in Google search potentially. Um, you provide a better client experience for those who visit your website. But, you know, I don't know about, you know, any other lawyers out there, but if I think about my own website, you know, I might get 30 to 50,000, you know, visits to my site a, a year or something like that. You know, I might write a blog post and I, someone, I might get four or 500 views on that content. When I'm writing on LinkedIn, um, you know, it's not uncommon to get I, I probably over the course of this year, I'll, I'll generate three to 5 million views of my content on LinkedIn. Yeah. It dwarfs the opportunity it's, or the yeah. amount of people who are seeing my content on, on my website. And again, it's not, it's not that you don't want to have content on your website, but don't you, wouldn't you rather have your content in the place where the very, the audience you curated is, is spending its yeah. time looking for experts like you. So it's a much yeah. more proactive approach to content creation where I think, all, you know, again, having content on your website is great, but it's more passive. You're waiting for people to come to you, whereas with LinkedIn, you're joining conversation. Would you would you recommend? Uh, uh, so uh, you know, LinkedIn also gives you the opportunity to write uh, 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 posts, right? Bigger posts, which are published mm -hmm. as uh, yep. 
sort of blog post right like it's mm-hmm. within 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 the the linkedin uh, uh, within linkedin uh, so vis a vis let's say uh, let's say you know as a as a uh, blog content is something also which is very popular right people want to write blogs now the question is was uh, blog post versus uh posting the entire content that you wanted mm-hmm. to post on the blog on linkedin right mm-hmm. uh i don't know like i i'm not i'm not saying which is the correct way but mm-hmm. which is a more uh um uh you know how do you, uh, which is uh, how do you interact more better uh mm-hmm. with the audience is it is it via linkedin uh, posts uh, linkedin stories or what i don't know what they're called exactly yeah. essays yeah, or something yeah yeah linkedin it's like the publishing you know like correct publishing. sorry publishing yeah yeah i forgot the term sorry yeah yeah now they the always change publishing. it <laughs> yeah. yeah so linkedin publishing versus blog posts was my question yeah. like you know uh, yeah. because uh, i think making blogs is also like it requires the time and effort to find somebody mm-hmm. to make that for you so i think lawyers uh, mm-hmm. can utilize that as well right yeah so um yeah i i i do think that uh i i don't think that publishing like the the publishing option on linkedin is is very very good. I don't think they okay. I, in my own personal experience with it has been for whatever reason, I don't understand why because it seems like, you know, there's there's sites like Medium and elsewhere where you essentially yeah, true. can have have a blog without building a blog. Um and LinkedIn publishing seems like the natural choice for that, but it just doesn't seem to get any any distribution. Um people aren't looking at those articles. You know, if I, you know, if i write a, again if I, i might write a text post that gets 15000 views if i if i wrote an article via publishing it might get 150 views for whatever mm. reason it doesn't seem to get the distribution um so on balance here, i would say this if you have if you are if you have a blog it doesn't hurt to then republish that blog content on linkedin as an article mm. got it i mean got you it. might do both um between the two you know i guess because the linkedin um because the linkedin publishing gets such poor distribution i mean i would say maybe mm. building your own platform as a blog or looking at a third yeah. party platform like medium might be a good way to go um i mean my my recommendation on this is always there's a third option which i think is oftentimes overlooked and i think is really accessible right now to many people which is if you're going to be writing longer form content meaning you know the type you know the 1200 word blog post or something uh look for opportunities to publish that content on third party websites which is mm. w- which have already curated the audience you're trying to seek right. so so for example um i write monthly columns for there's a site called attorney at work in the united states i mean obviously it's successful everywhere but it's mm. it's um it's one where um you know they've got a big audience of lawyers and they send out and i've written a monthly column for them for like the last 7 years um and right. and i also write a monthly column for law.com which is you know the mm. sort of the publishing company yeah. that does american lawyer and a lot of the large um you know us uh, uh in legal industry focused publications and i again i could you know i could have that content on my own blog i could have that content on you know as a linkedin article but you know law.com their the audience they they have curated which is all of the people that i want to reach is is pretty massive so i'm just mm-hmm. leveraging their audience in order to in order to you know get my content in front of more people I, and there's a yeah. benef- there's a benefit to it too which is that 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 type of content is subject to a gatekeeper there's an editor who has to like approve that content that kind of thing um so so you get a, a kind of the reputational boost from having content published by a third party there's it's seen as m- maybe more mm. valuable than mm. if you were just self publishing that on your blog i don't know if that's mm. always deserved or not but that's the way people perceive it um now it's a more of a challenge because you do have to get past the gatekeeper you do have to find those publishing opportunities but within every legal practice niche i think there's you know it say you're focused on a particular serving a particular industry like the pharmaceutical industry and you're doing you know transactional or litigation work for that industry there's probably some trade association or industry yeah. group that has its own conferences publishes its own newsletter maybe has its own website that kind of thing and and if you're focused on that industry you very well might be able to find publishing opportunities to get your longer form content in front of mm. their audience and it's much mm. more valuable in many respects than having your own blog i think it's not necessarily an either or you know answer to this yeah. question yeah. it's yeah. looking at like you you need to have you know you need to have some platform somewhere that something that you own that you can 
you can take with you. You can, um, people can find you. So that might be your blog, but then you need to go out and find where your audience is. Because if you're just, again, passive and sitting back and waiting for an audience to grow on some platform you've built, you're going to be waiting a long time because it's hard Absolutely. to build an audience. Um, so, so again, leverage or take advantage of the audiences that have already been curated by, you know, the, the, the markets that you're trying to serve. Um, so does that make sense? That definitely makes sense. And I yeah. think I'll draw the example of Law Seco uh, uh, here. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, these guys have a blog uh, uh, called blog.ipleaders. And uh, that's a legal blog. And they they make practical legal content. It's, it's the largest uh, legal blog in India so far. And uh, a lot of uh, lawyers do write content there. And because they have already uh, you know, made that audience, they already have the SEO game going strong. So mm -hmm. audience, the lawyers do like, you know, people who take the people who are, who are taking their courses and are right. And a part of the courses, they write for the blog and they also get a lot of uh, viewership from those kind of posts because that's also curated in a certain manner that the content that is going out is, you know, correct. And uh, of course, not speaking uh, uh, on specific topics. Mm -hmm. uh, but Jay, I mean, it has been a, such a great experience speaking to you about this. And I will just take... Uh, I think we are near the time uh, of uh, of eight thirty, but I will um, I will ask one last question sure. and uh, to you, which is basically, uh, you know, uh, when when you talk about building a profitable legal practice, and uh, uh, let's imagine a scenario of somebody who's again a lawyer who wants to become an entrepreneur, they want to develop that skill or you know uh, for themselves. Um, again, I think my question would be. Uh, few things like maybe maybe three things or two things that you would uh that they could do right now to mm -hmm. to to go to get into the journey i'm not talking about yeah. building a successful practice immediately sure. but mm -hmm. something that they could start immediately implementing so that they can you know over a period mm -hmm. of time reach that place yeah yeah so i would say two things i would say you you need to be thinking about um both marketing and business development Got i think it. they're they're similar mm -hmm. topics but they're yeah. but they're different in 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 these respects, your marketing involves communicating with people at scale, right? You're, you're speaking to a large audience. It's often, again, I talk about asynchronous, meaning you're not having a direct conversation with someone, you're putting messages out to mm -hmm. your audience mm -hmm. more broadly. Um, so for, you need to have a, a, some sort of marketing activity, ideally that you're doing daily. Um, so this might be in, uh, something like putting a post up on LinkedIn every day. Um, so that you're staying top of mind and visible to your audience um, on a consistent basis. So some sort of daily marketing practice that might take 20 or 30 minutes that you can engage mm -hmm. in that, again, kind of gets that flywheel turning, keeps you top of mind and building trust with your audience. Then on the business development side, you know, marketing is meant to address and reach your broader network, right? Maybe you've got a thousand people in your broader network and marketing can help you yeah can help you reach them. Business development is about, you know, more of a personalized outreach to people mm. who you've identified as the most likely to be able to help, help you in building your legal practice. So they, those might be current clients, yeah. prospective clients that you've identified, like maybe you have a, a pre-existing relationship, but you've just never sort of taken the next step with them. Referral sources, maybe other attorneys, maybe mm. if you're working at a law firm that's large, um, internal networking with your colleagues mm -hmm. who might be in a different practice, but might be able to refer you work. We call that cross-selling, right? Um, okay. So identifying not a huge number of people, but the 20 most likely to be able to positively impact your practice right now and making yeah. a list of those people. And then from a business development standpoint, I like the number 20 because it more or less corresponds with the number of business days every month, every mm -hmm. day making a personal outreach to one person on that list. So it's mm. Monday, you're, you're, and that yeah. might be an email, a phone call, a handwritten note, whatever the case might be, some sort of interaction that's more personalized for that person. So that way, after 12 months of doing this, you know, every month, at least once, you've made some sort of valuable and personalized connection with yeah. the, most, the most important people in your network. And the reason I think this is important is, you know, especially in this digital age, we sometimes have a tendency to treat everyone in our network equally, and we just spend too much time marketing to them, you know, in a, in a way that's that's great because again, it keeps you top of mind. But it's not mm. paying; it's not making any differentiation yeah. between. This is a bigger opportunity to, if I, you know, 
if I can, if it, there's a there's a real opportunity here, it's it's uh, one that's available right now, and this could have a much more significant impact on my practice. I'm going to spend some time dealing with that person directly. Yeah. So I think those yeah. two things, striking that balance where it doesn't need to take a lot of time. Um, I wrote a book that was published this summer called The Productivity Pivot. And one of the key pieces mm. of advice I provide in that book is the following, which is lawyers have a tendency to um, you know, really work hard on helping their clients to focus on their priorities, right? I mean, a client yeah, calls absolutely. with an urgent request and a lawyer will move mountains to make anything happen, mm. right? Work mm-hmm. nights, work weekends, like, you know, go to all extremes. But when it comes to their own priorities, like building a practice, which is the thing that's going to bring you financial security, autonomy, all these things, we have a tendency to delay, to defer, to procrastinate yeah. sometimes on those I things. Agree. So the, the core concept of the book is you need to start treating yourself as your own most important client, meaning mm. just make that mindset shift that my, my priorities matter too. Like I know I'm going to be spending most of my time on my client's priorities, but I can carve out at least one hour each day Maybe it's 45 minutes if you're just getting started, but to focus on myself and my priorities. So start treating yourself as your own most important client and start selling yourself one hour of your time each day to focus on these things that are going to have a much bigger impact over the long term on the, um, you know, the happiness, satisfaction and, and financial security that you'll have in your career. Absolutely. I think uh, I agree with the last point. Absolutely. Like, you know, I'm guilty of the same thing. Like mm-hmm. uh, it, uh, it's just, uh, uh, in, it, it's meant, I feel like, you know, I am mentally bogged down by the thought that, you know, it will take effort, but I don't think it's going to take that much effort, but right. it's just, uh, you know, that mental barrier here. But mm-hmm. uh, uh, so where is this book available? I'm definitely going to, I think, purchase a copy and read this because it seems to be something that uh, yeah. definitely up my league right now and something that I'm struggling with myself I think yeah. so available on the Amazon I'm, I'm available hoping. available on Amazon yep and um and there if you want to check out the um there's a url uh productivitypivot.com which right. you can get I have some um additional like worksheets and and guides that you can download right. for free on that, on that page, such, such that it'll help you with some of the aspects and some of the exercises that I mentioned in the book. All right, that sounds, uh, uh, that sounds amazing. And I'm definitely going to do that. But uh, uh, thank you so much, Jay, uh, for being here, for, for taking out this art, for speaking to the audience here. And I think uh, I've personally gotten a lot of insights into how to, uh, you know, uh, leverage uh, the social media platforms, especially mm-hmm. LinkedIn in terms of building a practice area a and you know building an expertise in terms of communicating to an audience uh with respect to on what i am good at uh basically so uh thank you so much for being here thank you so much for joining us and uh, uh, i think yeah and a couple of questions i've already taken up i uh, don't think there are many other relevant questions but um yeah um all right Okay, so uh, everybody here, please follow uh, uh, Jay on uh, LinkedIn. He's very active there and his posts are great and you would get a lot of insights into building uh, thought leadership and uh, building a legal practice there. So, all right. Thank you so much. Much appreciated. Great to be here. Yeah. All right.